Thank you. So um, I'm Jeff Walter. I am the uh, deputy head and also system engineering lead of the Atmospheric Science Data Center at NASA Langley Research Center. Um, so my talk is not going to be nearly as technical as the previous one. I'm going to talk to you, tell you a little bit about what we do, give you like a broad brush. Um, we're in the midst of a, a kind of a, um, you know, a big system evolution right now, so I'll describe some of our challenges and then also how we're using uh, some of the, these open source uh, technologies, in this case specifically OpenShift, uh, and how we're applying it to um, some of the projects that, that we're working on. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to uh, introduce, we have some of our uh, technical uh, support uh, staff here with me today. So we have Aaron Kirby, who is one of our senior developers. Um, we have uh, Brian Kinney and Sean Coogan, who I know are in the off audience somewhere. They, raise your hand, guys. There they are back there. And Thomas Simmons, who's one of our uh, senior system administrators. And we also have uh, Bledi Agoli, who is our uh, Red Hat support person who's under contract to us for a year. So if you have any questions about you know, uh, government procurement or management or strategy or boring things like that, you can talk to me. If you want to actually have technical discussions, you should probably talk to one of them. Um, so, okay, hands up. Uh, I have to ask this question. How many people are aware that NASA actually does Earth science research? Wow, okay, that's way more than I expected. Because usually I get, sometimes I get, you know, people are like, wow, NASA does Earth science. They think we just, you know, send stuff to Mars and, and you know, put people in space. So uh, that's really good because, uh, you know, after, um, na you know, shortly after NASA's inception in the late 1950s, you know, they realized, hey, you know, we're going to be doing planetary exploration. What better planet to explore than, than the one we happen to live on? Um, and NASA is, in fact, one of the largest um, Earth science research organizations in the world. Uh, in fact, our, um, our, the Earth Science Division's budget is probably 8 to 10 percent of NASA's total budget. It's about $1.9 billion a year. So um, we, do, we do quite a lot uh, of things. And uh, the key science questions that, uh, that we address um, in the Earth Science Division um, are mostly uh, you know, things around how the global Earth system is changing um, and what is causing these things. Um, how will the Earth system change in the future? And how can Earth system science provide societal benefit other than just you know, basic research? And these are kind of the, uh, the primary science focus areas. And it really covers the whole gamut of anything uh, Earth science and basically any, uh, anything you can detect from, from space is, is primarily what the Earth Science Division uh, focuses on, you know, using the vantage point of, of space to look at the, at the entire Earth system as a whole. Um, at the Atmospheric Science Data Center, we, are, we uh, cover a couple of these areas, um, atmospheric composition, um, energy cycle uh, and climate variability and change are sort of uh, primarily the space uh, uh, where we play. Um, but but uh, the whole division covers the, the entire gamut there. Um, so here is uh, actually the fleet of missions that we have um, uh, on, the, on the docket. And you can see this is a combination. All the, these missions are a, a combination of things that are uh, operating now, uh, things that are in pre-formulation, which means they're on the drawing board still, but they've been approved to go forward, and things that are in implementation that are currently being built uh, but haven't been launched yet. And, these missions really run the gamut of things from kind of big flagship missions. In the early days of the Earth Science, uh, or of the, the as in its kind of present instantiation, the Earth Science program, the focus was on building these big satellites that had multiple instruments on them. So you know you could take multiple different measurements at simultaneous points in, in space and time. And these things are like the size of a school bus, you know, and they're large. So we have everything, you know, from, from things of that size all the way down to CubeSats, you know, which, uh, you know, sort of two, three, four U uh, kinds of things. And a lot of those are, are, um, are in development now. NASA's moving away from the big flagship missions um, of, of the kind I described uh, into more kind of smaller and medium-sized uh, missions for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is those big flagship missions are they're really expensive, and they take a long time to, to develop and launch. Um, this makes us a little more nimble uh, in, in that sense. We can, we can go from mission concept to actually having something flying uh, in a lot shorter period of time. It also makes us a little uh, um, uh, more flexible with respect to changing political winds. You know, if uh, you know, somebody, you know, you have this, if you only have a few very large missions on your, on your docket and, you know, some for whatever political reason, you know, you have to cancel it. A lot of times it's an all or none thing. Um, 
So, so having you know, more smaller missions allows you to still achieve science and, and be able to respond to those things. And it's also a risk reduction strategy too because you know, sometimes these things do fail. I mean, we have some of the best engineers in the world uh, that build and launch these things, but they, but they occasionally, there will be a launch failure or maybe an instrument or spacecraft failure. So that's a lot easier to absorb if it's, if it's a smaller, medium-sized mission as opposed to you know, if it's a big, giant flagship mission. It's still a big impact. Anytime a mission fails, you know, it, it hurts. People feel it, but, um, but it allows us to sort of keep moving forward and, and without big, giant holes. Now, the reason I'm telling you all that is because what that means for us on the data system side is that fewer large missions, uh, or I'm sorry, fewer, more smaller missions creates more data complexity than fewer large missions for us. And you know, it's already a very complex space. You know, all the, you know, there's a variety of different instruments, they're all different, the data looks different, it's organized differently, they're measuring different things. Um, so it you know, takes an already complex problem and, and is just uh, increasing uh, the complexity of it uh, for us. So we have to figure out how to, how to be able to address um, that challenge there. Okay, so how do we you know, manage all of this data? Um, there's a, um, an, at the program level, uh, the NASA Earth Science Data Program, actually we have 12 different data centers, uh, we call them Distributed Active Archive Centers, or DACs uh, is the, is the um, vernacular that we use for that. And the DACs are co-located with centers of science discipline expertise, um, where we archive and distribute these data products uh, that get generated. When I say data products, they're things like, uh, you know, they're everything from the raw data all the way through the particular uh, geophysical parameters uh, that happen to be getting, uh, getting measured. So some of the DACs are located at, Nat like ours, is located at a NASA center. Uh, some of them are located at universities where they may have particular uh, levels of expertise in a particular um, science discipline. Um, and, uh, and some of them are located actually at other agencies. So one of our data centers is uh, managed by the U.S. Geological Survey, and the other one's managed by the Department of Energy. So, um, so it kind of runs the, the, the sort of whole space there. Now, and this, so this diagram shows where the DACs are, but it also shows where um, another term we have called SIPs, Science Investigator-Led Processing Systems. So what the SIPs do is they take the raw data, that's where they have the scientists, the scientists develop the algorithms that takes that raw data and, and processes it into these um, data products that have all the geophysical parameters, the measurements. You know, when I say geophysical parameters, I mean things like ozone concentration, sea surface temperature, you know, vegetation types, you know, on the surface, you know, all, the, all these kinds of things that you might want to measure uh, about the Earth system. And then they deliver the data products uh, to the DACs. And in some cases, like ours, the SIPs are often co-located uh, with the DACs and are part of the, uh, the DAC scope. So in addition to doing that function, just the DAC, the archive and distribution and distribution services function, we also do a lot of the processing. And I'll talk a little bit um, more about that later. Um, so data policy, I won't read this to you, but um, uh, one of the core uh, tenets of the NASA Earth Science Data Policy, there's sort of three uh, primary things. The first and most important one is that all NASA data is free and open uh, to the public all over the world. It's all made available. There's no cost. You know, it's just if you can get it, you can download it, you can, you can hold it at your, at your site, you know, you can, you can have it. Um, so this is, uh, this is something that, you know, NASA's, you know, been very proud of, you know, for a long time, uh, that they really are committed to, to sharing this, this data with the world. Um, the second thing is there'll be no period, there's no period of exclusive access after a mission launches. They do a mission checkout period for a certain period of time to make sure the instrument's functioning properly and all these kinds of things like that. But the, the core science team is not allowed to sort of hoard the data while they look at it and then make all their publications and then, and then share it with everybody else. That's a, they can't do that. Um, and then the third thing is that uh, NASA makes available or will make available um, all the um, source code that's used uh, to generate um, these data products. Now, this isn't like a lot of you think about how source code gets distributed. In most cases, this particular brand of source code, it's not like it's sitting on a NASA GitHub somewhere and you can just go download it. You kind of have to know, you have to sort of ask <laughs> for it. And if you ask, you know, you can get it. But, um, but this is changing. Some of the scientists chafe against this a little bit because they feel like it's their intellectual property. 
and, uh, and they, you know, they, a lot of them have put a significant portion of their careers into developing these algorithms and things. But, but the attitude around that, similar to the way the, you know, the attitude around open source software and things like that uh, has changed, they're starting to change this a little bit. Um, so at the Atmospheric Science Data Center, what do we do um, specifically? Uh, first, we do, um, we have data archive and distribution services that we provide for a variety of these scientific uh, data providers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do operational science data production where we will take the algorithms uh, um, from the, from the uh, data producers and we will actually manage uh, in the production environment the generation of those things. Um, we do science production infrastructure hosting where for, for some of our, our customers, we don't actually do the operational processing, but we do host their infrastructure. Um, we have a big computer, you know, uh, data center, computer room, and we'll host their infrastructure, but they're the ones that are responsible for their operations. And we have research computing infrastructure hosting. Uh, for some of our local Langley researchers, we have a certain portion of the infrastructure that's dedicated to allowing them to get on and do their analyses and things like that. And then we have a web hosting environment where we have a, you know, a lot of informational you know, kind of websites, but then also a variety of different web applications that we, where you can do things like you know, searching for particular data uh, that you might want to get, um, applications that apply uh, services to the data reformatting, subsetting, uh, uh, those kinds of things. So it's a variety of, uh, it's a mixture of those sorts of things. Um, but we have big challenges at the moment, okay? So our data center has been around for 25 years um, or so. And during that time, you know, we've evolved quite a bit. I mean, obviously we're not using the same hardware, much of the same tech we were using back in those days. But, but from an architectural point of view, um, you know, we support multiple different uh, uh, folks. So from an architectural point of view, we have a lot of stovepipes and physical complexity in our environment because we have a, we've, basically what it comes down to is we've done a lot of stuff to our house and now it's really time to clean the attic, you know, and do a lot of uh, uh, remodeling here. We have uh, kind of an unsustainable physical complexity, you know, a variety of different clusters that don't necessarily communicate with each other but need to um, in many cases. Uh, and, and it just, uh, it's difficult to manage and all these environments have their own configurations, their own versions of software, all these things. Um, we have a really challenging IT security and network environment. So NASA is a really big target uh, for hackers as, as, you, as you might imagine. And we take IT security very seriously as we should, but in, you know, in, in a world where you know, NASA, this stuff isn't getting easier, the, the, the agency is levying, levying more and more um, you know, IT security, you know, kind of lock down uh, certain things, uh, requirements on us. What they're doing that while simultaneously our primary function is to push our stuff out into the world. Um, so this creates you know, a little bit of friction as you, as you might imagine. But our OCIO is very good about working with us on this stuff, but it's, it's hard. I mean, and we've been, it's created a lot of churn, <coughs> excuse me, churn in recent months. Um, Multi-tenancy, so we have a, a variety of different, uh, you know, like, like as I sort of mentioned earlier, different functions uh, that we perform. So we have our DAC environment, you know, functions, the archive and distribution part, then we have the processing part, you know, then the infrastructure support part. And uh, so we have a lot of different people with different and sometimes conflicting needs and requirements uh, in the system there. Um, and we have an aging storage uh, uh, environment. So one of the things uh, we have, uh, we hold roughly six petabytes of data um, at, uh, at our data center. The program as a whole has roughly 30, 25 to 30 petabytes. We have about six. Um, but the storage is starting to age. It's sort of GPFS file system based, um, you know, and just broken up into six or eight building blocks. It's backed by, you know, a tape archive. Um, you know, sort of an SL8500 uh, kind of thing, which just, and managing, you know, between those environments and what to back up, and then we send stuff off site to Iron Mountain, you know, because we have a requirement that for certain, for disaster recovery, we have to send certain things at least 50 miles away, just stuff like that. Um, it creates challenges and it's a lot of churn, it's a lot of manual effort uh, to manage that storage. So we're trying to explore um, different, uh, different ways to, to deal with the storage. Plus, a lot of people's applications are kind of tied, uh, kind of tightly coupled to the way the storage organization is, and it limits our flexibility um, in what we can do with respect to moving things around and optimizing the storage. 
So all of these things combined make it sometimes difficult for us to quickly innovate and add new functionality. I mean, from an architectural point of view, you know, again, it's nobody's fault, but over time, you know, you add a little bit and you add a little bit and you found it, find that you know, to a certain degree you've painted yourself into a corner. Um, which is a little bit of what we've done. So from a strategic point of view, uh, we're taking this approach. We're trying to evolve uh, our, our environment to get out of this uh, ditch a little bit and, um, uh, and, and cre you know, have a more modern uh, uh, sort of environment. So strategically, we're gonna reduce the coupling between applications and physical environment, reduce our physical heterogeneity, and virtualize all those various complexities uh, that, that, that we have, um, eliminate the stove piping, um, improve our reliability and re robustness. So again, in a stove piped environment, any particular application is susceptible to, you know, single points of failure. Oh, my head node failed. Oh, my cluster switch failed. And that will take stuff down. Um, we want to improve our ability to rapidly respond to new requirements and deploy new functionality uh, quickly. Um, so now again, because of IT security requirements and our architectural um, issues. Sometimes this is difficult and, and staff gets frustrated and our users get frustrated because we can't move as rapidly as we, as we could otherwise. Um, and we want to stay aligned with our program uh, direction. So at the program level, there's a big push to put, start putting as much, thing, as much stuff as we can into Amazon Cloud. Um, I won't go into the whole story uh, about that because that would take another hour or two. But um, it, it it's creating a little bit of churn. The direction's a little bit uncertain, uh, but whatever we would do, we want to kind of make sure that, that from an from a, uh, architectural point of view, from the perspective of our applications and our staff skill set, that we're kind of ready to, to align with whichever uh, direction that they, that they end up going uh, in that regard. So, our, uh, so part of what we're you know, doing, as I mentioned, uh, that's why we're here, uh, is uh, uh, we're um, leveraging OpenShift for our application side of the house to start addressing some of these problems. Um, and, they, and our projects fall into sort of roughly three buckets here, is our web hosting uh, platform, um, the, our ingest and archive system, which we're calling uh, Parhelion, and, uh, and the science data production management uh, systems, which I mentioned earlier. So our current web hosting platform uh, was put together seven, eight years ago. It's hand-built FreeBSD jails, hand-built VM servers. There's a lot of manual promotion between dev, test, and production. And this, people hate this thing with the raging fury of a thousand suns because it just, it causes them no end of heartache. And plus, IT security hates it, and they want us to, to jettison it. So, so um, again, the obvious choice is we're moving things, uh, trying to port all of our sites and applications now towards, um, you know, towards OpenShift, where we have sort of the nice, you know, traditional CI/CD, you know, pipeline where every, you know, application owner or site owner gets their own project and they can make their content changes as they want, and if they can redeploy their applications as they want, and all the security scans are are kind of built in, and the only time the OCIO sees it is when it right when you're ready to deploy produ to production, and by that time, it's already been scanned to death, and hopefully you've worked out all your security issues. So, so that kind of, uh, it, the idea is that it you know, will improve the, the rapidity uh, of doing that, but we've been spending a while trying to get our first application up, and we finally did, thanks to uh, Aaron and some of the developers I, I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is uh, first application. It's actually been ready to go for a while. We've just been working with IT security, uh, um, you know, on getting some issues. This is just a, a, a data provider application that allows them to provide us metadata descriptions of their products before they submit them to us in a structured way. Um, okay, so the second thing is our data ingest and archive. Uh, so our current state is we actually operate two separate ingest and archive systems. I could tell you the backstory about why that is, but about halfway through it, you would feel your life force slowly draining out of you because it <laughs> does that to me every time I think about it. But there's two separate systems that we have. So one of them is called Angie. Don't worry about what the acronyms stand for. Um, one of them is called Angie. It was created in-house 12, 13 years ago. Uh, it's very monolithic, and it's, it serves us pretty well, but it has a lot of one-off workflows and one-off submission interfaces. Technologically, it's obsolete. It's based on you know old version of Java Enterprise, you know JBoss kind of stuff, um, and it's challenging to maintain and operate. You know, there's a lot of sort of heroic efforts. Um, we painted ourselves into some corners with it by being a little too accommodating with our 
our data providers instead of enforcing interface specifications to tell them, nope, this is what we need from you, this is how you submit, this is what we need your certain things to be structured as. So we have a lot of one-off uh, kinds of things. Furthermore, it's missing some key functionality. Uh, sometimes data sets, certain data sets uh, have different latency requirements and they're required to be made available to users or to get through the ingest process and, and out to be available for distribution in a certain period of time. And if there's a heavy load on the system and one of those high latency things comes in, there's no way to deal with that. It just has to sit and wait, uh, which is a, a, a big problem. Um, the second system we have is one called ECS, which was developed by the program office uh, at Goddard. It currently runs at three of the DACs, and it was started in the late 90s you know, by millions of developers, and there's billions of pages and doc documentation. This thing was a monster uh, for a while, and, and, it, and it still kind of is. It's, I mean, it's, it's not like it used to be in the old days, but it still requires, a, it's a lot of money for, I used to work in that program office, so I know how much money it took to maintain this thing, and it was just, your eyes would kind of roll and be like, really? Um, so they'd like to retire this thing, and, and you know, we want to help them retirement cause, uh, retire it, because it, it also creates a lot of churn for us, because we have to operate it um, and configure it. So what we've done is we, we started prototyping, and this is an activity that we did with the Red Hat Innovation Lab, uh, actually this past fall, uh, to sort of build a prototype of a new ingest and archive system. Uh, one that's sort of very uh, modular, you know, it's very service-based, we can create provider-specific workflows, but the vast majority of the functions that these systems perform, you know, it's, it are fairly generic. So um, again, you know, something that, uh, that is just a lot simpler, you know, a lot more modular, performs these basic uh, kind of things here. You know, you get a, they have a submission, you do some checksums on it, you do some validation on the metadata, you figure out where you write it to storage, you know, and then, you store it and then you're done. I mean, there's a lot more complicated things going on in there other than that, but it's, but at the end of the day, that's what it's doing. Um, you know, and, and some of these stages take longer than others. So one of the, the things that we're trying to do is have the, you know, auto scale, uh, various certain deployments, deploy, uh, services where and when are needed. So certain things like check summing these large files, you know, are computationally intensive. So they may take a little longer. And as, as the queue backs up, you know, we'll, you know, we auto scale based on, uh, on certain size. This is still a prototype. It's still very much a, um, a journey. The team is, is working on it now, so it's not operational, but uh, this is where we're uh, going in the next year or two uh, with this. Um, okay, so the last bucket is uh, science data production. So, so uh, current state, we, we do support multiple missions. We do the science data processing for multiple missions. Each one has its own bare metal cluster, and they have their own versions of OS and Python and C and you know libraries and all this other kind of stuff that has to be maintained. Um, and again, I, I talked earlier about single points of failure. You know, you lose one thing on those clusters, um, and it's and it's hard to it's hard to adjust. And these things are unable to share idle hardware resources. So when when these missions come online and they they get a hardware budget and it gets refreshed every three to five years, they get a certain budget. And they usually buy based on what they think their peak capacity is going to be or as much as they can afford. And they only need that peak capacity really. Periodically, they'll update their algorithms and they'll go through a reprocessing. They'll go back and, and say, OK, I want to reprocess all my, my entire missions. So we've got to be, go back to the beginning of the mission, reprocess all the data. That creates a, a heavy load. That's sort of the peak load. And they want to get it done in a reasonable amount of time. Those activities don't happen that often. So a lot of the time, that hardware is just sort of sitting there running at 10, 15, 20% at the most. Um, so a lot of the software that manages this processing, it's, again, it was built in some cases 10, 15 years ago. It's Perl 5 based. It's getting pretty old. Scenario configuration is manually intensive. It's, it's a lot of work to kind of adjust these things to add new algorithms or to change the way certain uh, uh, things fit together. And it's also difficult to track history and provenance. So in the very early days of this kind of thing, we had systems that were built and they used a relational database uh, as, as the back end. We found that that was really tough because every, every provider, every scenario, so the, the, their algorithms chained together in complex uh, sorts of ways and it became really difficult to manage that with a relational database because you, you, know, you had to normalize the schema, change the schema, and you know, it was just kind of a nightmare. So then they, there was, the reaction to that was they swung completely in the other direction. It's like, well, we're not gonna use any kind of backend database. We don't need it to manage the processing. And while that's technically true, 
it, now it makes it difficult to really kind of see what happened. You know, you have to use the, the end products as kind of a proxy, you know, just say, oh, I see this stuff on the system, so therefore I'm gonna guess this is what happened, which, which also isn't really a good, good place to be. So, but now we have a new mission that's coming online that we're, um, uh, it's a JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is managing and building this mission. Um, but we are going to be the data center for this mission, and we're also building the processing system because we have a long history with, uh, with the principal investigator uh, for this, um, and, he, and he likes what we do. Um, so, but this is a really interesting program, or a really interesting mission here. Um, it's called Maya, and you know, mostly what, what the processing consists of is processing the data that comes off the instrument itself. The, night, the interesting thing about Maya is it's gonna take that instrument data, which has its own complex chain of things. We're also gonna run a chemical transport model um, over the areas that, that Maya acquires data. And then, um, and then also a geostatistical regression model that will run periodically that co-locates or, or that you know, does a regression between what the instrument actually sees and what some ground surface monitors are actually seeing. <laughs> Rolls this all up into a you know, gap-filled map you know, for, for air quality parameters. And then downstream, these aren't part of NASA, but downstream you have epidemiologists that will take this information and, and do, you know, cross-reference it with geocoded birth and hospital records to, to um, research health outcomes uh, related to, to air quality. So, but this is a little bit more of a complicated scenario than, than what we've done before. So, so we're building this system um, actually in OpenShift uh, uh, now. And again, we're, we're, we're in the process of building it now. In fact, we have a critical design review uh, for this in, in two weeks. Um, and here's some uh, new things that are different about it. One, all the science algorithm executables that could deliver to us are gonna be container images. We've experimented with this, so it looks pretty good. Um, batch, we think we can do batch job management with native OpenShift capabilities. So the way we do this now is we have cluster management, resource management software. Um, specifically, we're using Univa Grid Engine or Oracle Grid Engine or whatever it is now. It used to be Sun Grid Engine, but it's changed. Um, where it's basically you, you, it's, you know, has queues and you just send stuff to a, to a queue and it, and, it, and it kind of batch processes it with, with some prioritization schemes um, in there for certain things. Um, we have to combine you know, uh, high performance computing and high throughput computing approaches. So what we do now typically, um, again, what I described is sort of more the high throughput uh, approach where we're not really so concerned with the runtime of any single job. We just need to be able over a period of weeks or months, you know, ran a certain amount of, uh, of production through the system, whereas the HPC approach is sort of a more traditional, how do I get this one application to run, to use computing infrastructure to get this one application to run as rapidly as possible. That's what the chemical transport model is doing. It's based on MPI, um, you know, and we're just now starting to explore, okay, given this environment or given this sort of paradigm that we have now, how do we get an MPI application to run um, in OpenShift, how do we, what's the best way to containerize that? I know some folks have done some work in that regard, but we're still, still a little unclear to us how this is gonna work. We have a few ideas, but we're um, working with the JPL guys uh, on figuring out how it's gonna work. Um, at the back end, I mentioned we weren't using databases. We have, now we're, for the back end, we're primarily using a graph database, and the one we're using is, is Neo4j. This has a couple of benefits, I think, um, the first one is that, that these scenarios lend themselves really well to, to being represented by a graph. You know, you have, again, complex rules and, and these sort of instances of these algorithms, will, they chain together uh, in complex ways. So it's useful for managing the actual uh, processing, but then when it's done, you actually have a, um, uh, your representation, your history, your provenance of what happened what inputs were used, what versions of algorithms were used, what versions of the in, you know, your data uh, was used. It's all represented there uh, in that graph and you can just go back and query it you know, and see historically you know, what you might have done or if you see something funny in a downstream product, you're like, whoa, okay, what happened here? Um, resource sharing and accountability. Again, one of the things that we wanna do uh, with these environments is to be able to allow one provider to use another provider's uh, uh, resources. So if you come in, the way I want this to work is if you come in and, and, you're, a, and you're a data provider, you're a mission, and you say, okay, I'm going to buy X number of capacity, so that whenever you want to use that capacity, you're always guaranteed access to at least that amount. But if mission number two over here isn't using their stuff, okay, great, you know, now I'm going to use mission number two's capacity because then I can get my job done quicker, 
then if mission number two comes in and says, okay, well, actually, I need some of my stuff back, then it'll, you, know, you can kind of shrink and contract uh, that way, which is uh, what we'd really like to do. Um, and then have all the signed state of production managed by a single system instance. So again, I mentioned we have multiple versions of, of uh, or multiple different systems running independently that do this kind of stuff, but a lot of the functions they're performing are, are common things. So the system that we're building here for Maya, we're, what we're trying to do is make it so that those mission-specific complexities are sort of well encapsulated, so you can just sort of focus your changes in those areas, and then you know, stuff, uh, all the common functions can be done by kind of one instance, so the operator gets really just sort of that one view and has, doesn't have to deal with multiple, um, you know, six, eight, ten different things running simultaneously uh, from a system perspective. Okay, so from, just to summarize, so our, the way our future is here, uh, what we're doing in the next, uh, currently and over the next course of the next couple of years, uh, we're gonna continue transitioning our applications and systems to OpenShift. This is very much a journey that, that we're on. We're, we're not there yet, we're still figuring stuff out, um, but, but we like what we see and we're pretty excited about it. Um, collapse and virtualize the infrastructure, probably using uh, something like, we have OpenStack instance, uh, two OpenStack instances on site actually, so we're, we're exploring, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we like to homogenize the physical environments. Um, and they're actually also, with Bledy, getting ready to explore um, um, actually putting the OpenShift on top of that OpenStack environment, seeing how well that works. Um, exploring transition to archive, or exploring transitioning our archive to object storage uh, for a couple different reasons. One, to get rid of our, those old tape archives, um, and then also uh, create uh, nice decoupling and abstractions between the applications and, and the actual data storage. Um, and future-proofing our architecture, you know, uh, one of the things that we want to avoid going forward, the lesson, you know, lessons learned of the, uh, from the past, is to set ourselves up so that we can pivot and we can more easily respond to, because things are always changing and we don't know what's going to happen, but, but uh, this will hopefully make us more um, uh, agile in that regard. And then from the program point of view, um, again, the, our program, like I said earlier, our program is focused a lot on AWS, but we think that, uh, that there's a lot of very large potential solution space there in our domain to uh, uh, demonstrate the viability of either hybrid or multi-cloud uh, future to achieve our, our mission objectives. So, okay, that was all I had. And I'm over. <laughs>